So who gets the balloons afterwards? I am. Whoever wants to lay the balloons. Okay, and and uh, since I can't really see very well, apologies. Bria, are you in the room too, still? Yep, I'm here. Hey, sweet. Okay, if it's okay, I'll introduce you in just a moment. And if you wanted to say a word or two, you're welcome to, but no pressure. <laughs> Excellent. Well, hey, good afternoon, all. Um, and I'm so sorry again that I couldn't be there in person. As you heard, I think I, I picked up a little bit of a uh, souvenir from my trip last week. Um, but we hope you had a wonderful and relaxing break and are ready for another semester of jam-packed, uh, but more importantly, impactful uh, programming here at the workshop. Before introducing our distinguished speaker for today, um, I wanted to offer, as I said, just a quick opportunity for IU's Interim Vice Provost for Research, Bria Perry, uh, to say a few words. Uh, Bria is a professor of sociology. In all of her free time, her research investigates the interrelated roles of social networks, biomarkers, social psychology, and social inequality in health and illness, with a particular focus on mental illness and substance use disorders. Um, so Bria, if you'd like to say a few words, you're more than welcome to, but again, no pressure. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so thanks everyone for having us here. I'm really pleased and proud to be here um, to start off, kick off this 50th anniversary celebration. Um, in OVPR, and Sherry and others can attest to this, we often call the Ostrom Workshop one of the crown jewels of Indiana University and certainly uh, one of the most productive and prominent among uh, the, the research centers here on the IU Bloomington campus. Um, and I think that this is really due, um, you know, in large part to the legacy of the Ostrom's outstanding work, which has such far reach and has been so impactful. Um, I think it's also uh, due to the outstanding leadership of Scott Shackelford and the other directors who are so passionate about the work that you all do here and about uh, disseminating it across the globe. Um, and then also, I just been so continually impressed by the network of scholars that contribute to the workshop. It really is a, a global enterprise. And as someone who studies social connectedness, I'm just really pleased and proud of everything that you all are able to accomplish by coming together um, in, in the spirit of the Ostroms and the workshop. So thanks for letting me say a few words and congratulations on the 50th anniversary. Thank you so much, Bria. That was lovely. <laughs> And that would actually be an interesting study that we could do. Maybe we could put our heads together about that. Um, yeah, looking at the, uh, yeah, the workshops, worldwide connections. Um, well, just a couple of quick words and then on to our um, distinguished speaker for today. Everybody, Lynn and Vincent had a vision, as you just heard 50 years ago, uh, for a place that would foster, not shirk, these linkages between political theory and policy analysis, but also be open to artisans and practitioners. In other words, that would have interdisciplinarity written into its DNA. Um, from their modest proposal, which if you haven't read it, I'd encourage you to take a look. Carrie has done some great work of posting a few snippets already on social media uh, to the political science faculty for a workshop, which would, as we've heard, avoid some of the rules governing research centers at the time. On top of everything else, I think Lynn really would have made an excellent lawyer. Um, their, their concept has grown to become what you see here today that uh, Bria just referred to, this global epicenter of governance research with an ecosystem of research programs, which we're adding to all the time, more news coming there, working groups, visiting scholars, and fellows who are together tackling some of the hardest problems we face from climate change to polarization. One of the ideas baked into their original proposal was to create a colloquium series. We're kicking off the 50th iteration of that series today with someone who knew them both well um, and really needs no introduction to the community, but of course we'll give one anyway, Lauren McLean. Lauren um, is the Arthur F. Bentley Chair and Professor in the Department of Political Science. She's an affiliate of, uh, here at the workshop along with being a WAC member, as well as an affiliate at the African Studies Program, the Committee on Native American and, and Indigenous Studies and the Center on Philanthropy. Um, her research interests are comparative political economy and public policy with a focus on the politics of state formation, public service provision and citizenship in Africa and the US. Lauren is the recipient of the 2016 David Collier Mid-Career Achievement Award and the 2017 Carnegie Fellows Award. Her research has been supported by grants, including from the NSF, 
um, so Social Science Research Council, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the U.S. Department of Education. Today, she's speaking on her project, Climate Justice in the City in the Global South, Power and Inequality in the Mobilization for Change. Lauren, thank you so much for kicking off our 50th anniversary of the Colloquium series, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, I am really honored. This is a little fuzzy, but I'm really honored to be here at the beginning of this uh, celebration of 50 years. I love this drawing because it looks like Lynn and Vincent are in front of their family home. Mm -hmm. And and I think the workshop really was kind of a family home. And someone earlier talked about the love and contestation. Um, and But it was really a place of where people from many, many different disciplinary perspectives, many, many different empirical sort of backgrounds and expertise um, from all over the campus could come together and sort of support each other, um, argue with each other, and think about big questions. Um, so I, what better thing to share with you than a collaborative project that really emerged from some of these relationships in the workshop? So this is a project on climate justice that I started with Gustavo Garcia Lopez and Prakash Kashwan. They are former IU PhD students and active sort of workshop affiliates continuing. Um, they are online with us here today. Um, we started talking about this several years ago, presented some of this material at the WOW in 2019. Um, and then went out and got a small grant from the APSA Special Projects because there's not that much going on on climate justice in political science. Um, and part of the grant was to develop this climate justice network, which is trying to bring together activists, scholars, practitioners to share resources, to share what's working and not at the local level, and also to share pedagogical um, resources. So another part of the climate justice project has been to work on an edited volume. Um, and we had a workshop last summer that was unfortunately was supposed to be in Nairobi, and it was on Zoom. Um, but we actually came together physically. So this is Gustavo, Prakash, and I in Puerto Rico um, in January to kind of talk about how all these chapters were coming together and the edited volume as a whole. Um, and so um, the uh, title of the book is Climate Justice in the City, Power and Inequality in the Mobilization for Change. And art and activism is an important part. And you'll see there's a mural behind us that the many, many, really amazing murals in different neighborhoods of San Juan um, and uh, that are really important for understanding the activism around climate justice um, uh, in Puerto Rico. So we'll come back to that, but you'll see more of them as we go along. So of course, you know, climate change gets some press, right? People are thinking more and more about climate change with these extreme weather events, hurricanes, droughts, flooding, wildfires. But what we would contend is a lot of the attention is sort of emphasizing the science, emphasizing the technology, um, the technical sort of challenges. And it's at this sort of satellite image view. So it is at a very macro level. Um, so this is Hurricane Maria as it's covering over Puerto Rico. Um, what we wanted to highlight was looking at some of the work on climate injustice. Talks not just about climate change as sort of a scientific phenomenon, but thinks about power and inequality. So those who contribute the least to climate change are impacted the most. As an Africanist, I don't know if you can see this line down here, you know, Africa as a region contributes the least to climate change and yet is extremely vulnerable to a whole lot of these extreme weather events. But what we argue in the edited volume is that a lot of the work, at least in political science um, and in development studies, has focused on differential responsibilities across regions and across countries. So it's very much at an IR level, sort of focused on the next COP, the next set of protocols, right? And what we want to do in this edited volume is move beyond the nation states 
and move beyond the focus on Europe and the US. Um, our volume really is focusing on these rapidly growing cities in the global south. And we're trying to move from just establishing the facts of climate injustice to trying to focus on the politics of those in local communities who are fighting for climate. So for the edited volume, our overarching questions are, what are the strategies and visions for climate justice in different cities of the global south? So people are thinking and conceptualizing this in very different ways. And then how do various inequalities shape communities' ability to organize, mobilize, and fight for climate justice? And so we've worked to gather scholars and activists to contribute these chapters from diverse cities in the global south. Um, this is a mural from one of the chapters that's focused on Mexico City and on sort of the urban community fighting for water rights. Um, but you can see we have chapters from Latin America, from Africa, North Africa, South Asia, East Asia, and then you may be like, what? Brooklyn. <laughs> so we had these great chapters come in from early. So another thing we're trying to do is sort of spotlight some early career scholars and scholars from the global south. And we had several chapters come in that were really highlighting sort of pockets of the global south in the global north. So that's another thing that we're trying to do. The Brooklyn piece is really focused on sort of immigrant uh, inequalities with recent immigrants in a waterfront area. Porterville is looking at sort of tensions with indigenous communities in Southern California. And Ithaca is also looking at sort of inequalities of age and mobilization among youth um, in Ithaca. So the research design for the edited volume is looking at variations of power and a whole bunch of different inequalities. So racial, ethnic, immigrant, gender, income um, through this collection of chapters. The volume as a whole is multi-method, it's multidisciplinary, and you can see it's pulling from very different perspectives, um, but it's also multimedia. So we're pulling in sort of this focus on these murals that are being um, painted. This is another one from, um, outside of the University of Puerto Rico um, that is, is really um, impressive. So I wanted to highlight just a little bit from one of the chapters that I did with some colleagues from uh, Ghana. So Gilfred Asyama is here, Mohamed Awal is here, um, and we are pictured with other uh, government and civil society activists um, from a, a region outside of Accra. Um, my son is also pictured in the back of the, the doing field work with his mom. Um, and so we have this politics of looking at inequalities and how citizens attempt to hold the government accountable in Ghana. So this is part of this Carnegie book project um, where I'm working on a sole authored book um, which is under contract with IU Press. Um, but this is a chapter that we're basically pulling together bits and pieces from this other book project, but really trying to make it more accessible for a broader audience. So the starting point is that there's widespread energy poverty in Africa. So more Africans suffer the worst level of energy poverty than anywhere in the world. So five, nearly 600 million people without electricity access got worse after COVID, but it's also expensive. And one of the things that this project is highlighting is that the electric power is unreliable. So how does climate change affect things? A lot of the power generation in many of these developing countries depended on hydroelectric power. And so with less rain, the water levels, so when I visited here, this is a picture I took when I visited and the guide was like, you can see the water levels are down. Well, what that means, and I am not an electrical engineer, but now I get invited to electrical engineering conferences, <laughs> the, the turbines don't work. So not as much uh, uh, power is being generated. And it's at a time that the World Bank estimates that uh, the demand for power has increased by 300%. So right when everybody has a cell phone, a laptop, and they want air conditioning and a refrigerator, 
the power is even worse. And so there's a massive electricity crisis in Ghana. Um, and this is a, actually a photographer from the Netherlands who came down to see what is the impact of this electricity crisis on the youth. It's affecting women who are walking in the dark from school, from their work, it affects security, it affects health, it affects education. Um, so there were these wide, and not to mention many, many businesses sort of clo closed and collapsed during this period. The outages were not like how we get an outage maybe in Bloomington that lasts for a few minutes or an hour. They could be 24 to 48 hours. They were long enough that you lost everything in your refrigerator, right? So it had major consequences for households. What's interesting though, is if you talk to people in Ghana, various cities around the country, um, everyone was upset, everyone was angry, everyone was frustrated but there were huge variations in how people participated. So there was a lot of attention to the celebrity protests. This is a famous actress. There are rap stars and comedians. You can see them wearing their matching t-shirts and they're organizing on Twitter this protest that happens in the capital city of Ghana. But in all of the interviews we did in wealthier neighborhoods, very few people participated in these protests. They got a lot of attention, but the lower income in particular people, I would say, talked more about their resignation, their frustration, but it was kind of this silent resignation. These are actually paintings from a contemporary artist um, who was at a university in, in Ghana, uh, in, in Kumasi, and he's highlighting sort of the youth and how they're pulling in and they're using older technologies like kerosene lanterns to try to kind of stay connected with their cell phones. So our question in this chapter is, why do some citizens participate and others do not? So I'm gonna zoom by a whole bunch of this pretty quickly, um, but basically by focusing on a single country case, we're sort of um, controlling for several important theoretical explanations about colonial legacy, Ghana is an Anglophone country, consolidated democracy, um, and is moving into kind of middle income status. Um, and what we do is really very carefully look at the subnational research design, um, thinking about communities, both urban and rural, but with uh, historical differences in terms of links to the incumbent, um, their percent of migrant populations, um, gender and income. And so we're using certain, there's a lot of spatial segregation in Ghana. And so you we're using sort of our knowledge of particular communities as a proxy for income in this study. It's also very mixed methods. This is a picture of a wall and Guilford and I as we're facilitating a focus group. Um, we did a lot of focus groups, but also archival qualitative um, and ethnographic observation. So the main argument for this chapter is that the Ghanaians are using very different political strategies to, to participate and seek accountability. So in the higher income communities, people are drawing on greater information about problems, greater knowledge about the political system, broader political networks, and higher levels of political advocacy to make different kinds of claims on the state. So when we had these focus groups, people talked about how in the high income neighborhoods, this is a high rise um, apartment building. You can see it's a gated apartment building um, in a, a high income neighborhood um, that they received fewer power outages to begin with and that the access to backup power was different. So when the power went out, Rarely in this neighborhood, somebody was in charge of turning the generators went on all of the power for the entire building sort of resumed very quickly, as opposed to here. So in a lot of the focus groups, people agreed that it really depended on where you lived, how you were affected. Well, the state had a different story. They're like, no, 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 we're announcing these power outages. Everyone's sharing them equally. Just look, you can track which neighborhood you're in, you can see 
when your power is going to go off, when it's going to come back on. So it looks really, really good, right? And it looks very equitable. But a local activist went out and he sent people out with some call time on their cell phones. And he was like, just tell me when the power goes off. And if you look here, there's a category here called the ministries. So that's downtown Accra, where a lot of the ministerial buildings are, or cantonments, and it says American embassy. So it's a lot of where the embassies are. And they had one to three outages in this month or two week period. Whereas some of these other communities that are sort of more recently settled would have as many as 38 outages in that same period. So there was a lot of inequality. What we also see is inequality in how people seek accountability. There was a lot. So Ghana is really uh, celebrated as a, as a relatively consolidated democracy, but a lot of Ghanaians felt like electoral accountability wasn't enough. It didn't happen frequently enough. They said in between the elections, we are helpless, right? And so they felt like that wasn't giving them enough leverage. I will say that um, it did give them some leverage. So the guy who was in power when all of this started did lose office, right? But even so, people are not sort of crediting that as their primary way. So fewer people talked about these protests, but a lot of what the wealthy um, uh, Ghanaians were talking about were using um, social media to sort of broadcast issues or calling into radio programs. So they were saying that this was a major way of communicating their displeasure. What was also interesting is that they were reaching directly to very high ranking politicians. So one focus group person said, sometimes when the power goes off in the night, we have to call on the managing director, which is a very high level sort of a political appointment to authorize the technical team to come. And with that, they'll be rushing even at 10 p.m. Meanwhile, they close at 9 p.m. So this person was really sort of bragging about his ability to get the state to respond. In contrast, in some of the highly uh, recent neighborhoods that were lower income, a lot more migrants um, in those neighborhoods, people said when, that their direct contact with the state was not high level, it was with the local service providers. So the people who are trying to get them to pay the bills or to repair things. And they said, when they come, we can give it to them. We can give it to them very well. So you see this sort of harassment, physical harassment. They also talked about, and there were debates in the focus groups about, you would never sort of jump up multiple levels to contact somebody, that you would go most appropriately to this local politician. The most local person is the first person. And that was much more common in the low income neighborhoods. So similarly, we, we can talk about this later, but very different exits exit strategies where higher income are basically substituting fully for their lack of power from the state. Um, whereas in lower income neighborhoods, they're basically trying in some cases to manage illegal connections to the, to the wires, um, which put them in a much more vulnerable situation. Um, what's interesting is climate justice in this case is framed not in those words as climate justice. Almost nobody talked about climate change or climate justice, but they were talking about their national rights as citizens and the obligation that the state had to provide this right of citizenship. So, um, it's my right because we can't do without electricity. It's a basic necessity the government has to provide for us, and that's why we've elected him. So this is a right because we all belong to the nation, and this should be a right for everybody. So this was a very common frame that was very different from the other chapters. What we highlight in this chapter is that this inequalities and sort of these different strategies are fracturing the social contract in this context and where there had been political support for cross-subsidization that is weakening and attenuating. 
So we think it has political consequences as well. So that's the Ghana chapter. Zooming back out to the climate justice volume, part of what we're highlighting from all of these chapters is that many of these community members are not using the language of climate justice, um, even when they are fighting explicitly for climate justice. And the notion of justice differs very much across these different contexts. So in Ghana, it's national rates of citizenship versus in Puerto Rico, it's a more politicized radical discourse about sovereignty from um, the colonial US, which you can see in the, in the mural here and the, and the flag. Um, the other thing is that we need to pay attention to multiple different kinds of inequality, not just income. So the ways that that race, gender, um, indigeneity intersect with income. Um, and that we want to celebrate these communities fight for climate justice, but there's a lot of struggle. So when we were reading all of the chapters at the end, we're like, oh, we were sort of celebrating success. Maybe that's not like the real takeaway but it's sort of in uh, celebrating the struggle. Um, and then we also wanted to highlight, you know, we're really looking at the local, but we're seeing how international political economy and these broader histories are shaping these struggles, even at the community level. And that democracy matters, but we're seeing struggle and sort of mobilization, even in non-democratic contexts, so it's not just multi-party democracy matters, that, but that space for a social, associational life that matters. So we hope to continue this conversation. Um, my colleagues and collaborators are on this Zoom. Uh, they wanna invite you all to join the Ostrom Workshop Working Group on Power, Equality, and Justice, and also to become a contributor and a participant in the Climate Justice Network. So we are looking forward to questions and, and conversation. Maybe I should um, stop sharing so that we can. And, and I'll handle the queue in the room and I think Scott's gonna handle the online queue. Does that make sense? That sound good, Lauren? Yeah, okay. Great, start with Mike, Eduardo. Uh, great to see you uh, presenting, Lauren. It's been a while since I've seen your your research, rather than administrative kind of stuff. Uh, and yeah, somebody said, and you and you're doing research still. <laughs> <laughs> good, very good, very. You've survived. Um, right. Great presentation, and your work always has such crisp research designs, really nice, sharp research designs. So I'm glad to see that in this paper. And I got to say. I just think you're a great choice for the first colloquium of this 50th workshop because this presentation, yeah, and this presentation connects so many themes from the from the workshop history that it was just incredible. Uh, beginning with the citizen evaluations that, that you're doing of, of public policy, and that was the whole focus of the police studies that started back in the 70s. Really, when they had the workshop, that's what they were focusing on. Lynn in particular, her work, and out there measuring whether, you know, the, the police would say, well, we've solved all these crimes and stuff like that, and actually go and talk to people, check how much light there was on the, you know, how, how rough the streets were and stuff like that. So your use of that data that uh, uh, showed that it wasn't quite an equal split in, in who gets power shut off and stuff like that was dead on. Uh, to the climate policy sort of component or, or climate justice sort of component that really was, was focused on Lynn's work at the end. Um, uh, although that's kind of more of a background factor in what you're doing here, but I think it's really important. And there's even the water connection with the hydropower, mm -hmm. electricity. And I would, uh, stretching it a bit, there's a commons connection and you came close to it in your presentation that really what we have in Ghana is, is a great example of a mismanaged commons when it comes to electrical power possibilities to spread around the population. Uh, and I think that's that's really critical. Uh, one, nice bit about federalism, you just sort of teased towards it there, that even in democratic countries, you will have these 
for national at the national level, the subnational level, you have non-democratic and vice versa and stuff like that. And so there's there's a lot of complexity. And Vincent would have found that very interesting. Um, and I think the the emphasis you're putting on threats to shared citizenship of the democracy is, is really, I mean, that's really, really what you're driving. But there's also a significant change in, in what you're doing that I didn't haven't seen in the workshop literature, uh, certainly in, in, in well, at least most of the 35 years or so that I've, I've been hanging around here. Um, and that's his focus on justice and, and injustice and, and uh, uh, the normative kinds of issues explicitly, um, although using good research projects for that. When Lynn and her folks were looking at uh, policy evaluation on the police studies, it really was most in terms of efficiency. Um, um, how how expensive is police care? What's the nature of the relationship between the police services and police officers and officials and the local communities and how does that affect? So that that was sort of a different thing. But the case you pick here is just great because uh, there's no way that people don't understand that there's inequality in here. You talk about them seeing lights on in the other neighborhoods over there or hearing them. Generators click on right away when the power goes off. I get just I mean, I can, I can imagine talking to the people like that and hearing sort of the uh, the sarcasm in their voices and, and all that. So I, I guess I'd ask you to sort of um, reflect on how your your work is. Do you see it as contributing to making more sort of moving the ocean workshop more towards questions of explicit questions of injustice rather than just questions of inefficiency, which is really where it started with uh, in good policy kinds of questions. Uh, and how do you see what you're doing as sort of contributing to in the next 50 years? So, and I think that's where, and I'll let Prakash and Gustavo jump in here too, but that's sort of what motivated yeah. our interactions was thinking about, I mean, first thinking about power and inequalities of power and how the institutional theories that were coming out of the workshop, um, frankly, we felt like sometimes there was something missing. Mm -hmm. and, that, and so we first started to work on that together in a special issue of world development, um, and then realized that this work on climate justice really sort of got brought power and inequality together for us in in places in in all of our work so i'll i'll brag about each prakash and gustavo have uh, prakash just published a book on climate justice in india um, so everyone should go out and buy that um, and then gustavo um, was uh, basically doing tons of work in puerto rico and uh, through his work at university in, in coimbra um, looking at climate justice in Puerto Rico um, and analyzing some of what's happening, um, like using new data that has not public documents, but looking at it in a different way. Um, and so I think there's some really exciting work going on. Um, so I'm here, but what's I think this is another theme that was important for me from the Ostrom workshop is that um, I'm the one who's at IU, but this whole new area is newer to me. And it was really my interactions with Prakash and Gustavo that I sort of became more knowledgeable about a whole new area of literature and scholarship. Um, and it opened up a whole you know, new set of research questions. And to me, that was sort of what was always exciting about the Ostrom workshop where these sort of um, multi-generational collaborations where it wasn't just multidisciplinary, but people who are sort of um, at different stages of their careers are learning from each other. Um, so, yeah. I don't know if Gustavo or Prakash, you wanna jump in at all. Hi, Lauren. Hi, uh, Michael and, and others there. It's it's great to to be here with you sharing uh, in this wonderful talk that you just gave thank you so much lauren uh really uh, i was uh also thinking about all the conversations we've had and how uh, your case really highlights uh, these these um, these key issues that you've brought today about the the project so i think 
uh, in terms of how these, uh, some of the questions that Michael also raised and some of the things you said made me think uh, the importance of, of youth and art that you highlighted uh, also through the musicians in the case of Ghana, no? like how these, uh, it, it was also very important in Puerto Rico in the protest that kicked out the governor in 2019 after after a corruption scandal. Um, and so this, uh, this uh, really connects uh, well with how artists are, are helping uh, be, uh, you know, Bad Bunny and Calle 13, these uh, reggaeton and urban artists were really important in, uh, and also the plena female, female plena, Plena Combativa group. So uh, a lot of this uh, Afro-Caribbean music that has historical roots in slavery and protest movements and working class struggles. No? So it's, it's uh, very connected there. And then with the environmental issue, I, I thought, you know, like the energy issue is also being uh, crucial now in Puerto Rico, where uh, the government uh, it already privatized distribution of uh, the last public company that we had uh, in the country with the water that they also want to privatize and um and uh, now they are private they just approved privatizing generation and um uh, and the whole excuse of the debt which is what i was i've been researching now the relationship between debt austerity and and the dis dismantling of environmental protection and 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 the privatization of commons basically in puerto rico uh, through the this is another privatization of the commons which will come with increased prices and uh, we've already seen the instability of the distributor because it's a company that doesn't have the experience and so these these outages that have become very common that were that similar to 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 your case i think uh, how and then it would be interesting to compare i haven't reflected enough on it how this connects to to different strategies by different sectors of society as you have highlighted i think that's one of the really interesting findings that you have in this uh, uh, the uh, the differences between how uh, richer neighborhoods and poorer neighborhoods react and, and use different strategies. I think this is a very valuable uh, insight. And the second very valuable insight, just to conclude, sorry for taking too much space, is the is the idea of the the right to citizenship and this difference with the right to sovereignty. In the case of Puerto Rico, I think there's also a, a big, the main struggle today in Puerto Rico, apart from the struggle against colonialism, which is always there, is the struggle for environmental justice and, and defending the commons. The privatization of the beaches through construction that is being fast-tracked also as part of the debt and austerity project, uh, uh, which is a colonial project now in Puerto Rico. Uh, so this is, is, is the fight for sovereignty is tied with this fight for the environment as part of the sovereignty, you know, of the of the in people of Puerto Rico. So thank you, thank you so much uh, for 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 a wonderful talk again, and 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 so glad to be here and happy and and for those beautiful photos that you shared, uh, bringing back uh, uh, great memories of our time in Puerto Rico. Hi Prakash and hi Lauren, hugs to everybody. <laughs> So very generative to like have these conversations across our different empirical um, areas of expertise. And I think that's part of what um, we've been trying to do is sort of think about what do we learn? So I was told once by a publisher that we don't really like publishing edited volumes anymore because a lot of times they're just a random smattering of papers from some conference and they've just been slightly revised and, and it doesn't... It doesn't, there's no there there. And so that's what we've been really pushing on is, is how, how does the bringing together of all of these chapters help us advance our knowledge? So it's not just a bunch of the little papers, but really thinking about the research design of the edited volume as a whole. Next we have Edu, and then I think Jamie is on. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, my question is actually about your last comment. It's about the process of collaboration. You have 12 cases, very different contexts, and very different explanatory uh, variables, right? Uh, people work in different parts of it. How did you make it happen? Like, did you start with a, a joint conceptual framework, for instance? You have some common methodologies, yeah. common ways of treating the data. That would be great to hear more, you know, and see how the working group is continue. We'll continue this way. Yeah, and I would say that um, that is something that I think we would all agree is like still in process. <laughs> um, so we started with 
an idea that the three of us had. Um, and so we had a sort of common set of goals. And then, of course, like most scholars, we start with writing. And so um, Gustavo and Prakash, in particular, started to think through an introduction that we could then share with these uh, case study authors. And so we, we sort of tried to, so we, then we had to solicit and, and find case studies that were really were trying to showcase, not just, so we had to sort of, I think a lot of scholarship privileges senior faculty. And so we were trying to work against the green and it's a little harder sometimes to find the PhD student who hasn't published yet, but is working on this. And so that was the Sunset Park, um, Brooklyn chapter. Um, we're finding people in other disciplines that, you know, we found a woman working in Egypt on informal settlements um, that like she works in architecture and design. But then one of the hard parts has been a lot of the, um, a lot of the work uh, is maybe part of broader projects where the goals are quite different. And we're like, no, we want it to be accessible. We want it to be like accessible to everyone. Um, and so we had activists who were speaking in one kind of tone and scholars speaking in another tone. And so I think we had a Zoom workshop, which would have been better if it was in person, but I think that helped um, for people to all come together and sort of see the project. Um, but there's, I think, one of, I think one of the biggest challenges has been to sort of work against some of the jargon and the donor speak from consultancy, like bullet point, like, like no, we don't want that. We want the, we wanted the guts of it. So I don't. Oh, great. That's yeah, it's, point. so it's iterative, but there's, there's some other work that's been published recently in political science. It's on collaborative methodology. And I think there's a special issue on collaborative methodology. And I think that's also very, very Useful. Uh, my, my Ghanaian uh, co-authors and I have a have a discussion about sort of the practicalities and the mechanics of working across continents um, that I think is really really useful. So one of the ideas is to build into your grant budgets extra money for writing time for collaborators. So not just for data collection, but for actual co-authoring and writing time. Because a lot of times it's really difficult for colleagues, uh, especially in the global south, to get the time off from consultancies to be able to participate in the more scholarly writing and rewriting and all of that. I think Janie was next. Sure. Thank you. And hello to everyone from Oklahoma. Uh, wish I were there in person, but soon. Um, and thank you, Lauren, for your fascinating case study. I've just I've learned so much through this. So yes, second, seconding everything that Mike and, and Ed you have said about your about the project. Um I I just had I had an observation. I have a question too. And just the observation is I just was not surprised, I'm sure as many of us were to see that the that the institution that suffered the least from the power outages was, of course, the state, um, which is just a reminder that you know Lynn of Lynn and Vincent's. Um, warning to us that just because people are in public service, quote unquote, um, doesn't mean that they've lost, you know, that they've lost their sense of values or preferences themselves. So, um, yeah, that was that was, you know, another another great example of that. But I was curious too about the notion of citizenship that came up because I, my ears perked up when you talked when you presented the example of a citizen who said, you know, that um, it's like it's our right that we should receive electricity from the government. But then that they followed that up with this idea that we belong to the government. And so that's such a very different notion of citizenship than we have here in the US. And so I was wondering, are, did you run into any Ghanaians who thought of themselves as citizens that the government belonged to them like we do here? And, and or does this notion of citizenship of belonging to go the government impact their sense of agency? Um, and 
you, or in the sense that you know they they that there's this reliance on the government to solve the problem and not to bring in or to create their own solution to the lack of like to the struggles with electricity. Yeah, that's a great that's a great set of questions. So first, I want to also um, give an example that so in addition to the ministries receiving the fewer power outages, they also weren't paying their bills. So a lot of the low-income communities, people were being exhorted, like, you cannot have these illegal connections, like, you need to be paying your bills, this is really eroding our state. And then meanwhile, it came out that a lot of the government agencies were, like, in arrears for paying their electricity bills, including the Ministry of Energy. So <laughs> it was like, come on, you know, like, and, and so, but the interesting so the, a lot of the conversations that we had people really i don't know that they said that they belong to the state but that they belong to the nation um and they really thought themselves to be part of a national community and i think there's an important distinction there um and and i think so in some of the other work in this book i look at some of the archival work and really at independence, um, electricity is one of the first public services that's developed and is really tightly linked with this idea of new citizenship in the independent nation of Ghana. Um, so I think it's very historically specific um, as well. I think Sean and then Gustavo. Yeah, uh, it's kind of piggybacking off Jamie, so if any of the responses are repetition of it. Maybe this is okay. Say that. Um, so I know one of the biggest struggles with climate justice is this notion um, of this heterogeneous and overlapping structures of power, um, not only at state, local, federal, but also at the global level. Um, and then the inequities that occur within each separate level of government, based on a lot of different factors. Uh, so when we start to talk about accountability, did you see variation? Uh, I guess I know you saw variations of who should be held accountable. Um, was there an <laughs> understanding of the structures and different accountability at each level? Yeah. Um, so I think there was there was definitely um, understanding and an explicit. So this is the great part if you're ever thinking about having a focus group. Um, a focus group is a lot of work. I see a wall is here, so a wall can test to this. Um, to facilitate a focus group takes like unbelievable expertise, and a wall and Guilford were amazing um, because you literally have to think about a million things at once. Um, but the reason to do all of that work and to gather those people is to get, it's about contestation. So it's not about getting data from the eight to 10 people. It's about the tension and the argument and the contestation. Um, and so even in those focus groups, we heard on multiple occasions, people sort of debating and talking about the multiple levels of political power. I wouldn't say that they actually talked much, if ever, about the global or international kinds of agreements. And it really wasn't, again, it wasn't articulated in terms of climate justice. It was articulated much more in terms of sort of local understandings of like of electric power, of water, of 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 climate, of weather. <laughs> Yeah. rather than climate um and so but there was a very nuanced understanding of sort of the differences at different levels i thought and different strategies i don't know if a oh, while well, i don't want to put him on the spot either but um if he wants to jump in ever as well so but yeah no that's a great that's very that's super fascinating. i also love that you talked about um, inclusive methodology. I think that's really important. Yeah, which is, again is not always, it's easier to say than to do. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I think Gustavo and then I think you follow up or did, was there a two finger on? No, I just want to make a comment. So um, 
I have a hard time seeing the connection with climate change here, because essentially climate change was giving you some excess in volatility of the climate, and that's the way it's hitting you. But essentially, I don't think that's a problem going on in, in developing countries. So let's start with an example in not developing countries. So last year, Europe was not in, in an uh, um, energy crisis. Now it is nothing related to, to, to uh, climate change. It's just, you know, uh, increase an, an uh, the price of an input because you are not using uh, Russian oil or Russian gas anymore. So um, uh, this, the main problem in developing countries is that because of population growth and development, the demand grows, and they don't keep building capacity to keep up with demand. That's the main problem, and it's unrelated to global warming. So you can shut down global warming and still have the same problem. So um, uh, again, you may think that if they have a problem with uh, with a climate change, the best way of fixing that is building capacity that essentially it's very brown. So it's like you just start burn, burning coal, which is, by the way, the cheapest way of producing energy. And also you don't depend anymore on, you know, draws or anything, okay? So um, uh, again, I, I, I think I really like the issue, but I think I don't see any connection with, 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 with the climate change, the very weak one there. Um, so uh, the second thing is, um, uh, so given that the wealthy, rich, elites, uh, they have so much ability uh, to um, allocate the scarcity because that's what's going on, uh, what about comparing with the pure market allocation? Because uh, essentially you can allocate through prices. Uh, so um, again, I know that that will be generating a very unfair allocation, but if the, if the rich has such a biased access to uh, the political allocation, it could be that the political allocation is even worse than having a monopoly trying to charge monopoly prices for everybody. So I would take that as a, as a reference point, just also to have a measurement of how, how bad is the political bias. No? And then the final thing, if I were poor in those countries, I would be very happy that the rich are buying these uh, generators because they're removing demand in peak times and then maybe more demand for our lower middle class poor people. So uh, that's one thing, but the political economy of that could, go, could backfire you in which way? Well, if they have a lot of access, uh, now they don't rely anymore in the system, you know, because they are using the generators. So maybe they are not fighting for a better system for everybody. Well, that's an interesting political economy mm -hmm. problem. There, okay, mm -hmm. but it seems that the, the 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 wealthy upper middle class they are fighting for a better system, and then in the back door they are lobbying to be first in line. So I think I see they are a very interesting political economy problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if I can two finger on that because I had a question about institutions of inequality, right? Which is kind of like what are the comparatives? Uh, levels of differences or inequality across these different institutions and organizations, given that you know you're focused on Ghana, but there's the counterfactual that Gustavo's talking about, and then the other cases. Yeah. Middle point. So I'm going to disagree about climate change. Okay. So the first reason is a lot of developing countries have built their energy systems on hydro. And so there is there is drought and there is a change in the climate that's due to global climate change that we have seen more recurrent and longer droughts. And so the ability to generate power has gone down. So at a certain point, the Ghanaian government, I think it was maybe 60 or 70 percent, or I mean, it was the huge majority of generation was coming from hydro. So they did what you said. They're like the population's growing, people that want more stuff, we need to make more power. And so we're going to do it as fast as possible because this is a political hot potato, right? So people are literally in putting up signs that says no power, no vote. Like if we don't get electric power, we don't vote for you, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the, they're doing it as fast as possible. But meanwhile, there are these European countries that are coming in and they're like, uh, maybe not coal, even though you can get coal from South Africa, maybe not, uh, you know, thermal, even though you have gas right off the coast that's yours, right? And so they're saying, why don't you do solar? Why don't you do wind? Why don't you do wave technology? What There's all of these other solutions. Um, and I think it's it's really, so this is the sort of political story that I think is really important. Um, meanwhile, there was a climate uh, conference 
And there are very, very few activists. So Gustavo and I have had really interesting conversations because there are climate justice activists networked in Puerto Rico. And they're working with transnational advocacy groups talking about these issues in a very different way than they are in Ghana. Um, so it is not being articulated as climate, but I would say that climate is a huge part of it. And a lot of donors are pushing for an energy transition that would be climate neutral or at least you know, not exacerbating. If Africa does what the other countries did, so that's the threat, right, is the counterfactual of the other way to generate mm -hmm. power. Um, one of the biggest donors is China. So they're building power plants or there are emergency powers. So the emergency powers, not just the solar generators that I saw, but diesel generators. And the president that lost that one election pulled up a Turkish power barge and he literally plugged into the national grid with a fossil fuel powered power barge that would give another 500 megawatts to the grid. So I think it has climate implications depending on how these politicians respond. Um, at the point about if somebody opts out of the public system, that is something, so a lot of my work has looked at non-state public provision or service provision. And that's, a, that's one of the things I'm really, really interested in is how does this shape the way that people think about citizenship who participates, and whether or not there's something that sort of continues to bond people across group for the good of the whole. And, and that's what I'm seeing sort of attenuating in Ghana, which many people think of as sort of a, a stronger, more positive success story. You had one comment, and then if you want to offer any final closing remarks before we move to lunch, which is in the other room right there, and then seating is across the rest of the workshop. Go ahead, Amy. Thank you. I had a comment, but I have to shift to Gustavo. <laughs> so my comment was actually just to put it on doing research, urban research in violent areas and how that affects research and how you know sometimes organizes crimes actually prevent local people from doing action, you know, making things more peaceful, which it's the case that we studied in, um, in Brazil. But my comment is, is uh, I'll agree with uh, Lauren, um, okay. and actually say that, you know, the urban South is the frontier of climate change, by far compared to any other frontier. And I can give you two examples of that. Uh, on the studies that we that we publish uh, globally on, on urban and global south. One is an analysis of sea level rise, which we did with uh, Douglas Edmonds here uh, and others. We did a, a global analysis of sea level rise in all delta regions of the, the globe, right? And uh, against population and settlement. And when you project sea level rise uh, at any rate, over 90% of the affected population are in cities in the global south. So that you know is a hot spot when you think about coastal sea level rise, for instance. Uh, we did another study uh, also comparing cities, cities globally in terms of infrastructure, because the issue is how climate can I put a parenthesis interacts there? with uh, infrastructure. Can I put a parenthesis? But that's a very different thing. It's like that 90% of the action of climate change is happening in developing countries. It's a very different statement too. The main problem of this particular sector, electricity, is climate change. What I'm saying is like, what you're saying could be perfectly correct, but still the effect of climate change on the electricity market, it's only 1% of the story. And both yeah. things are completely compatible. Yeah. No, so, you're totally right, because I was not thinking about electricity. I was thinking about urban areas and climate change within okay. the context of climate justice uh, in the global south. So you're totally right. I mean, on that on that front. But on on the on the argument, yeah, I think climate change is the big part of the story here. I think it goes back maybe to my question of uh, you know maybe making more explicit through how you're conceptualizing that interaction and how that conceptualization affects different sectors and can be used in 12 different sites. Like what is normal about conceptualizing the interaction between climate change and urban conditions, both infrastructure 
political uh, and of course demographic and so forth in a way that reflects what is happening in 12 case studies. You know? So I think making that explicit will, will go a long way uh, in, in clarifying this issue because we're talking about different things. Yeah, right? I think so. Yeah, so it's yeah. both statements could be perfectly yeah. correct yeah. at the same right. time. Yeah. Let's see anything to wrap up. I think we're ready for lunch. So last last words to you. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so, so I'll work on you uh, at lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> I really think that uh, especially if you're thinking about energy energy transition that the global south cities of the global south in africa is the fastest growing cities in the world um this is this is a huge issue and even if uh you know so this hydro sort of problem i think is prompting this in a lot of these cases and so you're seeing transitions and the question is, what direction is it going to go in? And so there's a political sort of expediency that I think is really not good for climate change. Um, and so it's really important to think of these things. I will tell you, I have joked about being invited to electrical engineering conferences, but you know, there's a lot of people who aren't thinking about the political economy when they're making these decisions. So I think it's really important to bring that multidisciplinary view. So thank you all for